Um, I'm a designer, and what I'd like to do today is, is sketch out a methodology that we use um, in the design of space. So we design communal spaces. We design spaces where civic functions are fulfilled. So they could be schools, community centres, cafes, restaurants, places like that. And we ask different questions to the way that the normal architectural approach treats space. So this picture here, this is not the, um, the tragic scene of a chair death. <laughs> what this is, is a simple visual metaphor. It's a, a redefining of space. And at the core of our approach is this idea of redefining, re-evaluation spatial relationships. This is actually part of one of the workshops we do, and I'll, I'll come to that as I talk. Um, I think to fit with the themes of today, if we can look at migration as a re-evaluation of space, so for example, moving from a familiar environment to a potentially hostile environment, and having to rethink how one assimilates and fits in, and even along those lines, to be a part of others, differing cultures, different languages that make up that. And we believe strongly that, as the, the speakers before have discussed, that this idea of developing cohesion, this exchange, is what makes and creates value. It's, it's the foundation of society. So what we do is we think of space in a different way. And we think of space as a conversation, an ever-unfolding conversation. So rather than a container in which we place things, in the sense that this is a building in which we've all been put, we think of it in this transformative way. And this idea underpins a way to understand how to design space. So for example, if we look to the East End and the history of migration there that's been mentioned already, those stories from the Huguenots to the Bangladeshis and beyond define that space and define those spatial relationships in a way that's very different from simply looking at the buildings themselves. So I think it's important then to ask what is design? What is the context of design in this? And we turn to Victor Papenek, who was a Swedish designer, died only a few years ago. What he suggests is that everything is design. We're all designers. Every intuitive conscious act, any kind of organizing, as he suggests, writing a concerto or painting a picture, is a piece of design. And this idea, this transformative idea, is hugely powerful because design is often held within experts, within a small domain, and that the idea that one can engage with that is, is cut off. To say to a group of people, to a community, or to a user group that they are the designers of their space is hugely powerful. It creates the opportunity for some incredible results. So our methodology we call co-design. Co-design has been around for some time. The term has been around for some damn time. The co meaning with. And at its foundation, it accepts that people have different perspectives, that people have different opinions, and that, in fact, thriving on that difference is a way to create special results. So engaging with complexity and engaging with emergence rather than trying to force things into particular shapes is a way to include and a way to foster ownership. This is this idea of embracing the social. And I think in terms of the themes again today, what this also suggests is that it's challenging top-down thinking. So even just the standard architectural approach of challenging the architect and the designer at the top working directly with the client and making assumptions about users at the bottom, you flatten that out and ask the users themselves through activities how the space should be designed. And I think, too, this has resonance with the way that migrants are treated when they arrive wherever they happen to come from, in the sense that there's an authority that is making decisions and controlling the, them that disenfranchises them from their new environment. So if we look to this idea of action-based, 
rather than saying, well, how do we find out about people? How do we find out about people's needs? Let's just ask them. Let's put out questionnaires. Let's have consultation documents. Let's invite round table speaking, that kind of thing. What we do instead is we engage people in activity. We engage people with creative responses. So I'm going to just talk a few some of those ideas. Here is an activity we use called Ask the Space. So the space is asking the questions of the participants in a workshop. And they may be questions like, where do you see yourself in five minutes? They're about setting a different response, a transformative response to space. And all of the intuitive things one feels when, enter, when someone enters a space around natural light, scale, materiality, aesthetics, that go deep but aren't often the subject of conversation immediately. And we offer this rhythm with the activities that are around working directly with an individual or working with a community as a whole. And this rhythm is around having people understand that in order for a space to work and be cohesive, it needs to fulfill both the individual's needs and the community's needs, whatever that community might be. And so having that idea transpose itself on the community is really key. So this activity is for people to engage with individually, whereas this isn't. This is about challenging the senses and the sensory perceptions of space. So if you try to deal with space without sight, it becomes a very, very different very, very different experience. And so much of our visual perception influences how we deal with spatial relationships. But at the same time, what we're offering here is this furthering of the, of, of the idea of space as conversation. So we're adding to the story of a space. And then it's not just an experience, but for us as designers, it's giving us insight and input to be able to design spaces better. This activity is called Blind Lead. And what we do is we create the scenarios that you see at the bottom left um, that fit the potential functionality of a space and that are then enacted within that space in order to give us as designers keys around congestion and flow, so the traces of the wool that's left by the blind participant, but also this relationship between someone telling someone how to negotiate a space through walkie-talkie and someone having to enact that blind, as it were. And again, the feedback always from this activity is how different space feels when you can't see it. And this speaks also for us to this idea of inclusive design, which is something which, which is in parallel with co-design, which is to say, why not design something for as many people as possible? Why not, don't be divisive about that. So, for example, designing the bottle opener for the arthritic hand is also the bottle opener for the so-called able hand, and that you're designing one thing that fulfills so many different briefs and so many different functions. So there's, there's needs here that are set and that help us as designers design more accessible and more functional spaces. We go now to look at some of the softer feelings. So conversation and storytelling is a huge part of how the brief is designed for us. Here, with Object Call, um, participants are encouraged to bring an object that represents some aspect of the space. It can be metaphorical or it can be literal. It doesn't matter. But what they have to do is they're encouraged to place them um, within the space and give a short introduction about why that was so. So someone very literally talks about storage, the coat hanger, but then someone brings in this, which is a picture of his unborn child, and talks about the needs of how, when that child has grown up, that space may still be there and be in use. And here, what you have is you can um, create the community co cohesion around that, that discussion, rather than just accepting that you need to define just that small space. These further activities, here we work a lot with non-textual stuff and non 
conversive stuff. So we're able to embrace different languages. In fact, we do co-designs in all sorts of languages. So participants work directly with images. Um, they may be the images um, that give a look and feel, the aesthetic of a, of, a, of a new space, or they may be connected to the storytelling of their past and their intention or their understanding about what that space may embody. So in the past, we've handed out cameras to do this, but now it's much more exciting because people are able to take those pictures with their smartphone, upload them, and then we print them out for the workshop. A key aspect, again, is this physical relationship to space. So we do a lot of model making. This is with um, young people in Worcestershire. Um, neat children, not in education, um, employment or training. And this idea of having to notice a space afresh, so to measure and to record and to scale a place that is well understood in order to change it, in order to transform it in some way, is hugely powerful. It's a kind of rapid prototyping, a sort of prototyping in real time um, with a scale model. So the co-design then is a series of activities and from those activities we glean the insights that help us create the brief for the space but it also help us create the design. And alongside that, in the realisation of a new space, we have an approach called co-make because we feel that alongside the creative responses to space it's really important to get to grips with materiality, to touch objects, to transform literally, objects. So it could be something very simple, like picking up a paintbrush and getting involved with the decorating side of things. There's a skill sharing element that goes with that. There's a cohesion around community that comes with that. But there's also other things to do. This is our youngest co-mate participant who built a lovely little Wendy house in the corner of here. And what we try and do is we try and deliver the space through a community, depending, of course, on relationships with contractors. And we have some amazing contractors that we work with that allow us time on builds to take communities into space and do particular things. So it's key to note that all of this is facilitated from the point of view of the design process. So we don't just let people loose on a building site. But what we try and do is we try and engage them directly with the way that um, spaces are created. So normally what would happen is that it would be handed over to the contractor and then handed back at the end of the project and there would be no engagement. There may be a possibility to go and look at things and take photographs but not actually to get to grips and build some of the, the furniture and some of the interiors. And a lot of the projects we work with, particularly with community centres and the smaller budget ones, we look at reappropriation. We look at um, scarcity is a positive in the sense that beauty can be, can be found anywhere. So the dreaded office carpet tile is transformed into something else. And I think there's these creative responses that come with working at communities, community level that allow people to see things anew. And this reappropriation, the need for sustainable responses to things, is hugely powerful. And it also is a hugely powerful beginning because people, communities often say to us, well, we'd like to do this, but what we don't have is money. It doesn't really matter. There's a need, obviously, to understand cooperation. And I think that's one of the key things that comes from the co-make is that through cooperation, one is able to deliver things. And that's demonstrated across the board with some of our, our projects. But why do it? I think that's one of the key things. I think for us as designers, it's not enough just to have the feeling. It's not enough just to take a community through the project. It's not enough to give them this sense of ownership. What we need is the spaces themselves. So we have examples here of some of the spaces we've created. But I think when we, when we look at those spaces, we, we have that the relationship to, to photos of architecture. Don't give us the atmosphere. And I think what we're saying is that if you treat the user, you treat the individual, you treat the community as central to the design process of space, what you get is a different kind of space. And I think that's the way that we should understand how the spaces we create for the future, whether they're for migrant communities or not, is helpful to, to form that conversation and to help us understand how best to live together. So thank you very much.